welcome along to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Emma Knight. And today on the show, we're talking about should I keep my own home as a rental property? And this comes from a list of the show. And I guess what we're really talking about is let's say you're about to go purchase another owner occupier, you're about to move into it because you want to move houses. Should I just keep the one that I've already got? and get some tenants, turn it into a rental property. Is that a good idea? Now, we've been kind of pretty anti this in the past, but that doesn't mean that you should never do this. You should just not do it if your owner-occupier, the one you're about to move out of, isn't a good rental it property. It be a default position. And I think because people, most people think, Owning a rental property seems like a smart idea, and and if they have the opportunity to upgrade their own house or or change where they live or they're moving to a different city or whatever, uh, they think well you know rather than have the hassle of um, having to find another place and then sell mine and have the timing aligned so that I'm moving my stuff to the new one, why don't I just keep it as a rental property because that was a good idea that I never did in the past. Look, there are some pros and cons to doing this. Why don't you just walk us through those, Andrew? So firstly, the pros are. Quite straightforward. So no transaction cost if you keep your property and turn it into a rental property. So if you sell your property, obviously there might be 25, 30 grand worth of real estate fees that you're going to have to pay. So if you hold on to your rent, your property as a rental property, then you don't pay that. You don't have to go through the stress of selling. So it's really straightforward. You just go and buy your new house, uh, move straight into that and rent yours out afterwards. Um, and you don't have to go fi- through the stress of finding another property as a rental property if that's the path you want to go down to. On the flip side, there's some downsides. So uh, the cons uh, of owning your house and turning it into a rental property, it might not make a great investment property. So any property can be rented out, but not every property is a good investment. So you might have a property with um, great locations for your kids to go to school and all those kind of things, but it might have a huge amount of land, which is going to be a hassle for tenants, might have really low rent um, just because of, you know, the, the, the area that you live in not achieving a really good yield might have high maintenance because it's an older property. Um, So you're not actually going on the numbers as if you were looking at a property that you purchased today, the opportunity cost, and that's really important. And often people are way too emotionally invested. So they're holding on to the property because A, they don't want to let go. But second, because they think, oh, well, you know, it's been a great house for us. We've raised our kids there. They're not actually thinking about the fact that it's it's probably not going to economically stand up. Now, you might think, well... Should I always sell my owner-occupier then? You know, should I never turn it into a rental property? And look, the answer is no. If it is a good investment property, and we're going to talk about in a second how you figure out whether it's a good investment property or not, but if it's a good rental property, keep it. Because that means you aren't going to have to pay those transaction costs. You're not going to have to find another property. Uh, You know, or if it's not the right rental property over the long term, another thing that you can consider, if it's got good potential and can be renovated, you could always renovate it and then sell that property at the newly renovated price. One word of warning if you're going to do that, just make sure you sell it while it's still your main home so you're able to claim the uh, main home exemption uh, under the bright line. So I wouldn't rent it out and and do it up while you've got tenants or something along those lines uh, because you want to make sure that you're not paying any tax on those gains. But I guess that raises, Andrew, like how do you figure out whether your current owner-occupier would actually make a good rental property or not, in your view, because this happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. So I think the most important thing is you treat this as if it was any other rental property and you actually run the numbers on it. And the best tool to do that is on our website, opuspartners.co.nz forward slash ROI, ROI for return on investment. Download that spreadsheet and then put the numbers in as if it was 100% lending, you're borrowing the entire value of the property. Because if you went out and bought a rental property, that's probably what you'd be doing. And uh, run the numbers based on the current market rent. What you don't want to do is run the numbers based on your current lending and your current lending setup. So if you've got a 30-year P&I term or 25-year term, for your personal mortgage and and you borrowed about 30% of the uh, value, if you're working on these sort of numbers, it's going to make it look like it's a better investment than it actually is. And don't uh, and don't run the numbers based on uh, a lower than market rent because you know often people might rent out to a friend or a family member or something like that, or not use a property manager. Actually, be true to the numbers and and put in what the um, what the actual market rent will be so that you can see if you 
bought this property as a rental property, would it actually be a good investment? And we see this all the time because if you go and trade me and you look at really expensive houses to rent in Auckland, you might be able to go and live in a $2.5 million house for $1,000 a week. Now, all up, that's roughly a gross yield of 2%. And you might think, well, how is it that these people are able to rent out $2.5 million properties with only a 2% gross yield? And usually it's because it was an owner-occupier, it will now have very low debt against it, and so renting it out for $1,000 a week might give them a really good cash flow return. And so if you run your numbers on this just based on your current lending, the cash flow might be okay. But what you're missing out is, well, what else could you do with the equity within that property? And that's why it is worthwhile running those numbers based on 100% lending. Because usually if it's a good owner-occupier, so it's got things like a massive backyard, you know, the land value is going to be great. But Tenants aren't paying extra rent just because it's got a big backyard on the whole. If it's got enormous living rooms and, you know, it's got three living rooms and three bedrooms, oh, great owner-occupier, but probably not a great rental property because tenants care more about the number of bedrooms than the number of lounges. And if it's a really high-spec fit-out, God, you've got all of the latest Fisher & Paykel appliances or or is it Bosch that are the really expensive ones? I don't go shopping for appliances. But if you've got... It really kitted out. You've got your home uh, audio system right throughout the house. That's great for an owner-occupier, but tenants aren't paying extra for those things. And so you've got to really consider, is this an appropriate uh, rental property? And those are some of the things that I'd be looking out for, you know, other than checking the numbers, running it at 100% lending, um, considering the gross yield that you're going to have based on today's numbers. You know, look, do you have some of those things that, make the property a great owner-occupier, but probably not a great rental property because what do tenants care about? Generally, number of bedrooms is the main thing that they are willing to pay for and an acceptable fit out. You know, they probably want something okay, something that's reasonably nice, but once you start to get up to something that's very, very high spec, then you've got the additional cost there in, in the property, the additional value within the property, but you're not necessarily getting extra rent out of it. And those are some of the things you're going to have to look out for. But Andrew, you see this all of the time. And I guess one of the things that we often see go wrong is people haven't structured it appropriately. Now, I know this is getting uh, into a bit of flux with the current tax changes, but just walk us through how you would usually set this up in the good old days. Yeah. And then we can talk about what to do today. Yeah, so I think the important thing to remember is there are changes pending with all of this tax and the interest deductibility of an investment mortgage, but uh, based on what it would have been pri- previously, what you'd do is you'd sell your own home to yourself through something like a look-through company or a trust, and you'd remortgage that at 100% of the value, and then you'd use all of that extra cash to uh, make sure that you minimise the amount of personal debt that you had. So you'd have a low personal mortgage and a high investment mortgage mortgage, which is the most tax advantageous way of doing it. Now, we are waiting for the government's uh, um, final legislation with the tax changes. Um, that will de- that will have a thing in there called rollover relief, which we've, we've heard a bit about, but we don't know how that's going to work in essence. But that'll be uh, hopefully some mechanism for you to restructure your debt so that you have uh, a lot of uh, good debt being tax deductible debt and minimal uh, personal debt, the bad debt. And this is where you've got to be really careful when talking to the bank, because the way most people come into have, turning a previous owner occupier into a rental, go to the bank, you've got 100k mortgage, 200k mortgage on your current property, and you say, oh, well, can I go buy this other property? I don't know, 800k million dollars, whatever it happen, happens. But yeah, 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 we'll lend you the money for that. Sweet. So your default position is to go to the bank, get the money for the new place suite, and you've got a low mortgage on your original property. So you need to get some advice around this to make sure you're restructuring it and telling the bank, cool, what I want to do is remortgage my uh, at my current owner-occupier place. I want the new place that I buy to have a very low amount of debt around it. I want to shift the money around so that's the case. And if you're not getting advice, if you're just going to a bank and um, telling them you want to purchase this new one, sweet, they'll give you the money for it, but it's not going to be set up correctly. And so these are some tricks that are really easy to miss 
if and, and you know you've got to get your head around them but it's really easy to miss if you don't know what you're looking out for and if you're not getting good advice about how to structure it with a mortgage broker yeah and I think also your accountant as well especially with um, the changes pending you, you want to make sure that you know how to appropriately structure things uh, uh, one other important thing to remember is once you uh, sell that property you reset the bright line test so if you put that property into a trust or a look through company or something like that or a company then you're going to be in a position where you reset that bright line test which is going to be for 10 years for a rental property that's existing so uh, you might want to give some consideration as to whether or not uh, you're going to hold that property for 10 years or if it's going to be less then maybe maybe you again want to have some uh, advice around that um, but I think one of the important things to remember is that I've seen a lot of people who have structured incorrectly and it ends up just being a bit of a cash flow drain on them they have a massive personal mortgage um, I remember one investor that I first worked with when we first started the company a number of years ago, he had um, three rental properties, all of which were about 50% of what the current market rate would have been for rent. Uh, and when I spoke to him about why that had um, been the case, what had happened is he'd used each of these three properties as stepping stones to get into the neighbourhood that he wanted. Um, and uh, the result was he had three moderately small investment mortgages, three um, moderately low rents because he'd rented out to the people and then they just stayed there because of how low the rent was. And he had one big personal mortgage and was nearing retirement. And so the only way to get out of all of this was to sell all the rental properties and put all the cash into his own house then. Whereas if he'd structured a bit better previously, used a property manager and actually had fair market rent and knowing what he was doing with the numbers, he probably would have been able to keep those into retirement. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, Ed and Andrew, you're banging on about the same stuff, getting a property manager, charging the right amount of rent. It's because I know what you like listening to this show because you text me and message me on Instagram. Oh, but Ed, I'm not going to use a property manager. And what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to take my owner-occupier house and I'm going to rent it to a friend that I know. And because they're my friend, I don't need a property manager, which means I'm going to save 10% of the rent. And because I'm going to save that, I I can charge them a bit less. And then you're going to leave them in there for 10 years. You're not going to increase the rent because you feel too bad. You've structured it incorrectly. So you've got a very low mortgage, as Andrew was just saying with that previous case study, on the rental property. You think it's okay because the, the rent's covering the mortgage in that case. But you're missing out on the fact of two things. One, your, your personal mortgage of the house you're now moving into, the one that you bought to live in yourself, that mortgage is potentially very high because you structured wrongly. Second thing is, well, what else could you have done with the equity within that rental property? Sometimes the most appropriate thing is to eat the real estate costs. And what I mean is sell, pay the real estate agent, then take that two, three, four hundred k worth of equity in the house that you've been living in and put that into rental properties because maybe you could purchase two or three using uh, additional rental properties using that equity with an appropriate gross yield. And what are the other tests that you could use when you're considering, am I going to keep my current owner occupier as a rental property, is run a very quick gross yield on it. So if it's a million dollar property and you think you can rent it out for $500 a week, and these are pretty low numbers, we're talking about a gross yield, something like 2.6%. It would be a much better idea to sell that property and go purchase a good growth property, a property that's going to increase in value relatively quickly, but get something that's going to yield somewhere between 4 to 4.5%. Four because that is going to give you much better coverage. The, the rent is going to cover more of those interest costs. Maybe you can buy two or three of those because they make better rental properties because they've got smaller backyards, they've got a higher number of bedrooms compared to the living space, and they're potentially in a better location where uh, renters can, can afford, and there's good rental demand for that. Fantastic. Let's wrap it up there. But please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. It really does help us get the message out to more people. And hey, make sure you check out the next episode of The Deal. We have just released a new show actually last Wednesday, so go check it out at thedeal.co. Really interesting properties from Foxton. So go check it out. Thanks for listening to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Ed McKnight. And we're going to be back again tomorrow with even more daily strategies, tactics and insights to help you get the most out of the New Zealand property market. Until next time.